All right, I've now started the recording. So just for the recording, I started by just putting a poll out, asking people their experience. And given the experience level is a mixture, I'll kind of try and go to a level that is good for everyone. So I'll just stop the poll now and poll. Sounds good. So we're gonna start with an easy problem and then we'll probably get time for two problems today. So we have one easy problem and then one harder problem. There's a third one on this sheet. We'll probably go first problem, skip the second one, unless we have lots of time, and then go to the third one. So for this first problem, again, if you just joined, the link to that is in the chat and it's the presented problems, big link down here. So the first problem today is taxi. So in this problem, there's been several complaints about a taxi that's been driving the wrong direction down one-way streets. So basically the, the person has a house, a house one, and you know where the taxi is currently located. So located at four, for example. And if you know the taxi started at location one and is now at location four, it must have gone the wrong way down a road because there's no way to get to location four without going down a one-way street backwards. The options are you either went backwards down this road or you went um, like backwards down this road or something. Like you went this way down this road and then backwards down here and then the correct way down here. But either way, to get from location one to location four, you must have gone down a road backwards. However, if you're at location five, then to get from location one to location five, it's quite possible that all roads are followed in the correct direction because it's possible to get from location one to location five by going the correct direction every time. So more specifically, the problem gives you the number of locations, the number of two-way streets and location of one-way streets because there's some two-way streets and one one-way streets. Now this is a two-way street here. This is a two-way street here, whereas the arrowed ones are one-way streets. They describe you the streets, the two-way streets and the one-way streets, and you have to answer for each location whether or not it's possible to get there without using any one-way streets in the wrong direction. So in this case, to get from like, so for location one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, if you start at location one, then it's possible to get location one without going any streets in the wrong direction because from one to one, I guess by definition, that's fine. To get from to get to location two, well, it's impossible to get location two without going down a street backwards because you can go the correct direction down here, but then the wrong direction up here. So across here, it's impossible to get to two without going the wrong way. So you can get a, the police officer can give them a ticket because they know they must have gone down a street the wrong way. For location three, well, this is a two way road here. So it's perfectly valid. You can get from one to three following all the rules. Location four, I said, I said that before, you can't get from one to four without breaking rules because you either go down this street backwards or down this street backwards. For location five, you can follow the rules to get there. So it's all good. For location six, it's just impossible to get from one to six. Like unless you have a flying car or something, there's no roads to get you there. So. That's in this problem, we say that's impossible. And for location seven, well, it's impossible to get to seven without doing something illegal. So you would output, following the output format, you would output no ticket for all the ticks, ticket for all the crosses, and impossible for the one that I said impossible for. And that corresponds, I think, to this output here. We have no ticket, ticket, no ticket, ticket, no ticket, impossible, ticket. Yeah. In this first example, we have, so there are five locations. There are zero two-way streets and there are two one-way streets. That's what that input, input means. Then 
there is a street from location three to location two. So we have one, well, we have five locations, one, two, three, four, five, a one-way street from three to two, and a one-way street from four to one. So at location one, well, you can get from one to one without moving, so there's no ticket there. For location two, three, and five, it's impossible to get there at all. For location four, you can get there, but you have to go down this street backwards so you get a ticket. And then as I said before, sample input two corresponds to the one we just looked at. For sample input three, well, there are two locations, but zero streets. So location one and location two with no streets between them. In this case, well, if you're at location one, you never get a ticket because you're where you started. But at location two, it's impossible to get there. So we output impossible. Now the constraints are, there are up to 1,000 locations, up to 1,000 two-way streets, and up to 1,000 one-way streets. Any thoughts on how we can solve this problem? Give you 30 seconds or so. It shouldn't be particularly difficult, this one. Or is anyone confused by all the problems asking? Well, we can kind of answer in two different ways. The first way is, is it possible to even get from location one to other locations? And the second part of it, can we do it legally? So for the first question of whether it's even possible to get from a location to another location, to do that, we can imagine all streets are two-way streets. So every street, consider it as a two-way street. And then the question just is, can we get from location one to the other locations? And to do this, we can do a depth first search, a DFS, which should be covered in, I think, comp 2521. But all a DFS does is, in very short, for people who either haven't done that or can't remember, we just traverse the graph, basically, and mark everywhere we visit. We do it recursively. So we'd start at one, we go to three, we go to five, we go to two, we then walk back up five, three, then walk to seven and to four. So we just kind of keep walking along edges to get everywhere we can. And everywhere we never visit is in unreachable. And so the answer is impossible for anywhere we can never visit. Like location six. Now, that's the first part of the question. The second part is, which locations can we visit legally? Now we have a method of determining whether we can visit a, a location at all. How can we modify this to check whether we can visit a location legally? store the nodes that can be visited from every other node. So for every node, you store where you can visit. In fact, yeah. I think the second idea is a good one. Um, we can just, in our DFS, we only traverse one way down one way roads. And I think for those of you who don't know what DFS is, I'll briefly explain it. So imagine we have a graph, like if we draw it out, or we just use this example, it's a function that looks something like this. We have like a void DFS, and then like a, the node we're at, call that node A. In a DFS, we mark this node as seen. So we go seen A is equal to true. And then for each edge, like that goes to E, we like DFS from E, let's say that goes to E. So what do I mean by that? Well, we start at one. If we call DFS for one, we mark one as seen. 
And then one has one outgoing edge, at least in the correct direction, if we only consider the correct direction, has one outgoing edge. So from DFS one, we would call DFS of three. Now three has two outgoing edges. It has an outgoing edge to one and an outgoing edge of to three, to five, sorry. Because from three, we can go along this two-way edge back to one or down to five. And so we have one more check in our DFS. We go, if we haven't seen E yet. So if not seen E, then we DFS E. So we don't DFS to one again because we've already seen it before. So we don't do this, but we go to five. And then from five, we would visit um, nowhere because five can't get anywhere without going the wrong way. And this would be the extent of our DFS if we were only considering the correct direction. Now, if we did a DFS where we allowed ourselves to go backwards down one-way roads, then from one, we would DFS to three and also to four. But the way DFS goes, it's recursive. So we'd first go to three. And then from three to five, from five to two, we would then go from three to seven and from seven to four. And then at one, one would try to go to four, but four has already been visited, so we'll stop. I think I'll use some code to demonstrate that more clearly, but I think if you're confused about DFS, let me know. But I think most people in the poll indicated that they're done two, five, two, one. I guess also very briefly, if you don't know what a graph is, a graph is this structure here precisely. So you have some vertices and edges. So you can think of them as like intersections and roads. And so you have these vertices and these edges and you have and edges between them. And so that these like intersections and roads and edges can be direction, like they have directed edges, they're one-way edges, or they can be bi-directional, which is a two-way edge. The next question is, how do we represent this in code? And there's a few ways to do it, but the easiest way is, if I zoom in, for each vertice, we store a list of all the other vertices it can go to. So if we assume for now, every edge goes in both directions. So we have one, two, this is our graph here. So this corresponds to an edge from one to two, an edge from one to four, an edge from two to four, an edge from two to three. Then one would store a list containing two and four. Two would store a list containing one and four. Three's list would just have two, and four's list would have um, one and two. And two's will have three. We have one, three, and four here. So for each vertice, we just store a list of everything we can reach from that vertice. That's a good way to represent this in code because it's quite easy to work with. And to store a list, we can use something called vector in C++. Now, I think that may have been covered in prior workshops, but if you haven't seen it before, a vector in C++ is not like a vector in maths. It's like a list in Python, essentially, or an ar array in other languages where you can, an array that's not fixed length. So it's an array that can change lengths. It's useful to use this to store this we call this an adjacency list. It's useful to store an adjacency list using vectors because for each vertice, we can have an array representing all of its edges. But because each vertice has a different number of edges, then we can have an array which can change lengths. So in C++ to that, we hash include vector. To do input, we hash include C standard IO. This is stdio.h in C which gives you printf and scanf. And we can use namespace std. I'm going to clear my screen so you can see what's going on. 
So we're going to have, in this problem, we're going to have two adjacency lists. We're going to have like the legal one. This is all the edges we're allowed to travel on. And this is just kind of all the edges. So if we allow travel in two directions, so this is everything is two directional. Everything is bi-directional. And this is only roads in their correct direction. And we have one vector for every vertice, hence an array of vectors. We also have n, the number of vertices. We have x, the number of two-way roads, and y, the number of one-way roads. We then scan in the input. So we scan in n, the number of vertices, then the number of one and two-way roads. Then for each two-way road, we have, let's say, row from A to B. We scan in A and B to represent we have a road from A to B. This is a two-way road, which means we can get from A to B, but also from B to A. So to represent that, we say in the legal list, A can get to B. We use pushback. This is the same as dot append in Python. It just says add B to the vector of A. So say we can reach B from A, but also we can reach a from B, we got both way rounds. And in our all edges, where all edges are bi-directional, we do the exact same thing. Finally, we also do, for, for each one directional road, we scan in A and B. The only difference is, legally, we can get from A to B, but not from B to A, not, not allowed. So we remove this line here. We can get from A to B, but not from B to A. But in all edges, everything is bi-directional. So we keep the B to A link. Now we have two adjacency lists. To do a DFS, we're gonna have two DFSs. So we're first gonna go from node one to every other node. So we're going to say from vert, sorry, I'm using node and vertice interchangeably. They mean the same thing. I'll try and just use vertex. So from vertice one, we're going to visit every node we can, every vertice we can, sorry. From vertice one, we're going to visit every other vertice we can. So we have our scene array and we have avoid DFS from vertice A. We mark vertice A as scene. Then for every other vertice, so this says, so find all the vertices that can be legally reached from A. So this just says for every B in this vector, so for every B that A has an edge to, if we haven't seen B yet, so if not, if not seen B, then DFS to B. And if we run this for A, for one, let's print everywhere we visit. We're gonna print visited A. And let's run this code. So compile. Where did I save this? Oh, it's lowercase w, that's why. Week four. Compile our code. These are just useful compile flags that add some warnings to our code. But compiling is similar to in C. If you haven't seen C++ before, we use G++ instead of GCC. So we compile our code and then let's run it on the very first sample input here. Now in this sample input, we have five vertices and we have an edge from three to two and from four to one. And we see that our DFS only visits one. That's because one can't go anywhere else. 
if we change this ed from one to four instead, we rerun our code. Now, it, now it looks like this. We have an ed from one to four. Now our code, our DFS visits one and four because it starts at one and then it recursively calls itself at vertex four. If we now look at this example here, this is the sample input, the one we looked at, the diagram looked at the very start. In this case, if we draw it out again, it looks like one has an edge to three. And there are two bi-directional edges that, that goes in both directions. Four has an edge to seven in both directions. Otherwise, we have an edge from two to five. So two to five, from three to five, two to five, three to five, from four to one, and from seven to three. And from one, well, from one, we can visit three, and from three, we can visit five. We can't visit anywhere else because we're traveling in the wrong direction. So our code outputs visited one, three, and five. Now, if instead of doing legal, we did both directions, uh, what do we call it? All edges. Recompile our code and run it. Now it visits everywhere because we start at one. We go from one to three, then from three to five, from five to two. Then our code will go from three to seven. So we visit seven. So one, three, five, two, seven. And then from seven to four. So because we treat every road as being two-way, it ends up visiting everything. Now, we just have to mark which vertices are visited on each of these two trips. So we have the scene array here. We'll do a first trip just for legal edges. And then we'll run a second DFS, we'll call it DFS2. So this is find all the vertices which can be visited just at all. We do, we, we call the all edges list. And here we're gonna, in this case, gonna mark seen as either zero or, or one. In this second DFS, we'll mark seen as being two. Now let's run this and see what it does. So we call DFS and we call DFS2. And then for each vertice from, so for i equals one up to n, we're gonna print scene i. DFS2 at one, sorry, like this. And we see it's two for almost everything, except for six, because we can never visit six. There's no edge to six. Now, this is because the reason why nothing is one, we called the less restrictive one after the more restrictive one, because this one, this first one, only takes one way edges in the correct direction, whereas the second DFS takes one way edges in both directions. So if we were swap the ordering of them, so we do this one first and then this one here, and we also modify this DFS so it checks whether it's not one. Then we'll see that we draw the example out to make it clear. So we have one and three in both directions, four and seven in both directions, then two to five, three to five, four to one, and seven to three like this, and then we have six on its own. We have down here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We see that the ones labeled one can be visited legally. The ones number two can be just visited at all. And the ones labeled zero cannot be visited. So six can't be visited, that's why it's zero. One, three, and five can be visited legally, hence why they have a one next to them. And all the other ones have a two next to them.
because they can be visited illegally. And so to fix that, we say, if seen i is equal to one, then we can visit it legally. So we print no ticket like this. If, if seen i is two, that means we can visit it, but not legally. So we print ticket. And finally, otherwise, if it's zero, we print impossible. Remove this print statement here. Now, if we run our code, we compile it again and run it. It outputs no ticket, ticket, no ticket, ticket, no ticket, impossible ticket. And that corresponds to the correct answer here. Let's run it on our first example again. We see it gets the correct answer, the answers match up. And finally, let's run it on the very final output here. And we see we get no ticket followed by impossible. So again, it gets the correct answer. So this is an example of using DFS, a technique that a lot of you already know, some of you might not, to solve a problem. We do two DFSs because there's two different conditions we need to check. Let me know if that doesn't make sense. If not, we'll move on to a second problem, which is a more advanced application of DFS. So I'll give you all a minute or so to read the second problem, and then I'll also go over it. So I'll give, yeah, I'll give one minute. Give you another 20 seconds. Okay. So in this one, we can ignore the first paragraph. It's not very helpful. So we have a room with tea tables. At each table, there's a person counting votes. Also, there are two pol political parties and each one has people called scrutineers. Now, there's only room at the table for one scrutineer. So each table has one vote counter and also one scrutineer. However, the two political parties wanna make sure that every table is monitored so it's fair. And so to do this, well, some tables can see other tables. And so a political party is happy if either its scrutineer is at that table or it has a scrutineer at another table that can see that table. Now, each table has a, li each table has a list of the other tables that can be seen from it. However, to make it a bit confusing, some tables list the tables that can be seen from it, whereas other tables list the tables that can't be seen from it. So as an example, in this first example, yeah, there are five tables. So number them from one to five, 
one, two, three, four, and five. Now, this three here means that from table one, we can see three other tables. And those tables are table three, table four, and table five. From table two, we can also see three tables. There are table three, table four, and table five. From table three, we can see two tables, which is table one. From table three, sorry, we can see table one, table two. So table two and table one, that already edges there. From table four, we can see two and one. And from table five, we can see two and one as well. So we have this star shaped here, this kind of weird shape here. Now, in this case, if we assign the two political parties are S and V. If we assign S to the first two tables and V to the last three tables, then look at the S's. Well, S's can visit, can look at these two tables because they're sitting there, but they can also look at every table that can be seen from these tables. So they can also see every other table, which means the S political party is happy because they can look at every table to make sure the vote counting is proper. Now, the V political party, on the other hand, well, they can see these three tables at the bottom, but also they can see the other two tables because they have a purse, because table five can see table one and table two. So they can look at all the other tables too to make sure the counting is fair. So they are happy. Now, what other important constraint? Yes, that's a very good question I was just gonna to get to. So you're guaranteed that if table X come onto table Y, then table Y come onto table X. So that means, if you think of it as a graph, that means our graph is bi-directional. Because we can, we can think about it as a graph where the tables are vertices, and whether a table can see another table are edges. So in our second example, there are four tables. So let's number them one to four. Now this means that table one can see two tables, number two and four. So one can see table two and table four. Now this input format here, this N here, means that this is the list of the tables that table two can't see. So one line per table, one, two, three, four. This means table two can't see one table and that's table four. So table two cannot see table four. In other words, table two can see every other table. So two can see one and two can see three like that. Now table three cannot see two tables, one and four which means three can't see one or four. So no, which means three can see two. So we have an edge from three to two, which is already there. Finally, table four can see one other table, which is table one, like this. So our graph structure, where the vertices are the tables and the edges are which tables can see other tables, looks like this. Now, how can we assign scrutiny to tables? Well, party one, so the S party, could have people here and the V party could have people here. Now S's are happy because S's can see these tables, but also these tables here. And the V's are also happy. Now the output format is you output for each table who sees them. So the output for this will be SV, SV, because table one, table two, table three, table four. Now there are other possible outputs. So a second possible output is well, what if S had these two tables and V had these two tables? So the answer will be S, S, V, V. That works too. So does V, V, S, S and V, S, V, S. These are all valid arrangements. However, if we had S, V, 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 this wouldn't work because although the V party can monitor every table, the S party in this case can only monitor 
table one, table two, and table four. They can't monitor table three in this example because they don't have a person there, nor do they have a person that can see that table. Finally, in the third out, third case, there's one table and that table, we can't see any other tables because there's only one table. Because there's only one table, we can only put one screw near there. So we can either put an S or a V. We can't put both. And so one party isn't going to be happy because one of the parties won't be able to see this table. And so it's impossible to make every party happy. So does that problem make sense? For the constraints, there are up to 200,000 tables and the length of all the lists they give you is up to 500,000. Where each list is either C, if we can see all the tables, or N, if, if the list of the tables that we can't see. So the first thing to think about it is let's translate the problem into a graph problem. The problem now reduces to, given a graph, given S or V to every vertex, such that every vertex either has an S or is adjacent to an S. And has a V or is adjacent to a V. So in our third case, which looks like this, we had one, two, three, four. We could put S, S, V, V because every vertex either has an S, that's these two, or is adjacent to an S, that's these two here. In, for the Vs, every vertex either has a V or is adjacent to a V. So we've kind of decomposed a problem from being a problem using some flavor text into a graph problem, which makes it a bit more understandable. So we have this problem here. Let me know if you don't understand this kind of reframing of the problem. The only weird thing is the way we're given this graph, we're not given it in a normal form. For some vertices, we're given which vertices they're adjacent to. And in other cases, we're given which vertices they're not adjacent to. Now that is quite weird. Um, and what's a consequence of this import format? Any thoughts on kind of what this weird format does to our graph? Potentially. So to give you a bit of a hint of what I mean, there are 200,000 vertices in the biggest input. How many edges could there be? Well, in, in a normal graph problem, they tell you all the edges. And so they put some sort of constraint on the edges. But because in some cases they tell you where there aren't edges, the number of edges is really unbounded because it's possible that every vertex has an edge to every other vertex. If we had the input, 200,000, and then every line was N0, 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 that means there are no edges. No, no, sorry. That means for each node, they can't see zero things, which means there's an edge between every pair of vertices because vertex one 
doesn't have an edge to no one. Vertex 2 doesn't have an edge to no one. And because of that, that means Vertex 1 has an edge to everyone. Vertex 2 has an edge to everyone. Vertex 3 has an edge to everyone. And so does Vertex 4 and every other vertex if we just keep going forever. Which means there are, well, approximately 200,000 squared vertices. Um, it ends up being 200,000 choose two, which is the maximum number of edges there are. So there are 200,000 vertices and 200,000 two, choose two, which is a lot of edges in the worst case. That's an interesting constraint, but otherwise we can get the graph from the input fairly easily. And so the, the main feature of this input format is that the graph we get given can have a lot of edges. So let's imagine I just give you a general graph, like this graph here, for example. How are we able to solve the problem on this graph? What's an algorithm we can use to assign either an S or a V to every vertex so that everyone's happy? So every vertex can either has an S or can sit adjacent to an S and every vertex has a V or is adjacent to a V. Any suggestions on an algorithm we can use to solve this problem? On the given example I have done here. This is our graph we get given here. Any thoughts? Well, Right, so I'm going to make a DFS tree. So I think we'll look at trees first. Let's say the given graph is a tree. So in this case, the given graph is not a tree, but um, so a spanning tree is just, we take the graph and we remove some edges so that it is a tree. So if we do that, so if we just keep the green edges like this, we now have a tree. We've removed this edge here, but we have a tree. And then we have two examples on how we can solve the problem on a tree. So I'm going to redraw our graph, but as a tree. So we're deleting the edge from one to five. So we have a tree, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we just alternate levels. So we put an S here, we put a V here. We put an S on these two, a V here, and an S here. So we go down level by level, and we alternate whether we put S's or T's. Now, if you haven't seen a tree before, a tree is a graph about cycles. Now, you've probably seen like a decision tree before, or like in probability, they have like tree diagrams. This is the exact same thing. It's just a graph without, us, without cycles, which is what a tree, like a decision tree looks like this, like something like this, or like a probability tree looks like this. This is in fact the exact same structure we have here. Hence the same name, a tree. And how we assign S's and V's is we just yeah, alternate each level. And this is a valid assignment because if we add back the extra edges, like the edge one five, well, an extra edge only gives the people, the scrutineers more vision. But even if we have no extra edges, well, this layer one can be seen by layer two and layer three can see the layer above and below. So each layer can see the layer above it and the layer below it. And because every second layer is controlled by the same political party, that means that every political party can see every vertice because 
S's from here can see this V and this V. And then this V here can see this S and these S's. And so everyone is happy. And one way to do this is to do a DFS. We do our same DFS from before, but we keep track of how far we've traveled from node one. So if I raise our tree over here, go back to our original graph, in our DFS, we start at one and we give it an S. We then go to two and give it a V. We go to three, we give it an S. We then go back up to two. We go from two to four, give it an S, give this a V, give this an S. So we do a DFS and we alternate, which is the same algorithm which two people suggested. And that always works because of the, what I said before, each layer can see each other layer. Okay, what if our graph is disconnected? So what if instead of this nice input over here, I gave you this, input here, how would you solve it in this case? Any thoughts? Can we use our same algorithm from before? Exactly. We can do the same thing for every tree or more generally every component because they're both trees in this case, but obviously in the problem, they're not guaranteed to be trees, but obviously conceptually we can think about them as trees by just deleting any extra vertices. Because again, an extra vertex is just like helps us. So deleting a vertex won't change, won't, won't make it harder for us, but because we can always solve it on a tree, we can always make it into trees. So okay, we go S, V, V, S, S, V, V. And for every component, so every different tree, we call these connected components. That's kind of the graph terminology for them. That name should be fairly obvious. They're connected and they're like separate components. Hence the name connected components. So for each connected component, we run our algorithm separately. Okay. Now the question also says, output when it's impossible. When is it impossible? Exactly. So if there's a single vertex, which is on its own, so if we had like a vertex eight here, that's on its own, that's the only case when we can't solve it. Because if there's two or more vertices, then it's fine. We do our DFS, like two vertices, we put an S here and a V here, everyone's happy. But if there's a lone vertex, in that case, we can only put one scrutineer there and not two. And so the only case we don't like is when there's a lone vertex. When there's a lone vertex, we output impossible. A lone vertex is just a connected component of size one. That's another term for it. So we now have an algorithm to solve this problem. The next question is, is our current algorithm as written fast enough? Now, the complexity of DFS, the time complexity, is order n plus m, where n is the number of vertices, and m is the number of edges. This is because we visit every vertex once in a DFS, and we loop through every edge once in a DFS. So we have a solution that's com time complexity is the number of vertices plus the number of edges. Now, in this problem, the number of vertices is 200,000. That's all good. 
But the maximum number of edges I said was approximately 200,000 squared. Because it's possible that there's, there's a complete graph. Complete graph means every vertex has an edge to every other vertex, which has approximately n on two. It's about n on two divided by two, um, or n times n minus one divided by two, which you know, just approximately this value here, which we plug this into a calculator, we get, should be able to do this by hand actually, but that's, but we get four times 10 to the 10, which is two slow one in a second. A computer can do a reasonable like speed computer, like, you know, an average laptop or judging computers can do about 10 to the power of between 50 to 100 million operations in a second which is between like five times 10 to the seven of the 10 to the eight operation in a second. A faster computer can do almost up to a billion in a second, but certainly no judging computer can do this many operations in a second or even the 10 second time limit we have on this problem. It's too slow. Maybe a supercomputer could, but certainly your average computer will not run this, will not be fast enough to do this in, in 10 seconds. And so, this solution as written is too slow. We can't just create the graph naively and then do it, do DFS. We have to somehow be smart about how we process this graph. Because although there's at most this many edges, the sum of all the lists is up to 50,000, 500, 500,000, sorry. So we want to modify our DFS so that when a vertice gives us this n list, where it gives us the vertices that can't see, we want to be able to process that quite efficiently. Are there any thoughts on how we can do that? Just clear here. Yeah. In the interest of time, I think I'll go over it because it's quite a smart trick. The trick is, so in our DFS, we start at one. We want to DFS to everything one can get to. Now, if one has a type C list and so it gives us everything it can visit, then we're all good. But if it gives us a type N list, we're not happy. But we can do something else instead. Let's also keep a list of the unvisited vertices. Keep list of unvisited to keep track of every vertice we haven't visited yet. And let's say this list is 10,000 long. There are 10,000 vertices we haven't visited yet. And let's say that vertex one has an N list containing three things. So that means vertex one can't visit three vertices. If there are 10,000 unvisited vertices and our node or our vertex can't visit three of them, that means at least 9,997 of them, our vertex has an edge to. Because our vertex has an edge to everything except three things. If like the input was like n three like four seven eight, that would mean we have an edge to everything except four seven and eight. So if we keep a list of unvisited vertices, and we pick something from that list, it will almost always be a vertex we have an edge to, and so we can DFS from that. And more accurately, what we can do is we can loop through the unvisited list. So we just loop through every vertex we haven't visited yet. And we just check, is it in our list that we can't visit? If it's not, then we DFS to it. So to repeat that, if we have an N style list, that is we have a list of vertices that we cannot visit, we loop through every unvisited vertex. And if we can visit it, so it's not in our list, then we just do a DFS to it. To do this, 
we can store this structure here as like in a set or something, or even a linked list. Anything works really. We can use our favorite data structure. It doesn't really matter what we use. And then we just loop through this list until we reach a vertex, which isn't in our other list here, our list that we can't visit. And then we DFS to it. Now, what's the time complexity of that? Well, the important thing is when we loop through our unvisited list, the number of vertices we skip over is at most the number of vertices that we don't have an edge to, which is the list, which is the length of our list here. But because the sum of all these lists is small, then the overall complexity of doing this ends up being quite low. In fact, it ends up being order sum of list sizes, which is 500,000 because that was the constraint in the problem. So to repeat, we have a DFS, which is one of two things. If C, then just loop through edges. If N, we loop through unvisited edges. Unvisited vertices, sorry, not edges, vertices. So we loop through unvisited, sorry, my unvisited vertices. Loop through unvisited vertices. Um, my iPad is stuffed up, so I can't write. We loop through unvisited vertices and we visit everything which isn't on our list. Loop through the unvisited vertices and DFS to everything and this ends up being quite fast because in both cases, in this case, it's just, we look through the number of edges. In this case, although the number of unvisited vertices might be very large, because every time we do a successful DFS, we decrease this list by size one. And so overall, we just loop through every unvisited vertice once plus one time for every time we skip over it. Because if we don't skip over it, then we'll never loop over it in the future because we, we remove from our unvisited list. And so the complexity ends up being order N plus sum of list sizes. Now this is quite a complicated problem. This will be one of the harder questions in this contest, but I think a good example of how we can modify a DFS and represent a graph in quite a weird way to solve a complicated problem. Now, if this confuses you, please let me know. I'm happy to go over it again. Um, otherwise, we'll move on to the second part of the second hour. But I guess we don't have time to code this up, unfortunately. But are there any questions about this problem? I understand it's quite a difficult one, so you're probably some confused people here. So please let me know if you have any questions about it. In particular, why it's fast enough, why the complexity ends up being order 200,000 plus 500,000. Okay, so that there's no questions about this, in which case let's move on to the second hour. So I'll stop the recording.